The Blackberry Bush Written and narrated by Paul Comish Chapter 1 In an isolated valley, lush with life and full of trees, a patch of blackberry bushes grew along a babbling stream. This particular patch grew the most superb blackberries in the entire valley, and each one was supple, rich, and full of nutrients. The blackberry bush became famous amongst the creatures of the valley, who would all partake of the patch peacefully, for there was plenty to go around. One season, something odd happened. There was something different growing amongst the many vines and leaves. A speck of pale red, much smaller than the other blackberries, had appeared. For the first time, a vine in the patch had produced an imperfect specimen. Not knowing what to make of this flawed fruit, the other blackberries would accost the runt with cruel insults. Why must you stay so small and unripe while the rest of us live in glory? asked the other blackberries. You bring shame on this bush. Fall off the vine already, they would say. The small blackberry would weep, but never wish to be like the other blackberries. They were perfect, but they were also cruel and vain. The days went by, but the blackberry grew no bigger or happier, as the other blackberries began to get picked and eaten by the creatures of the forest. The life of a blackberry is quite short. To linger on the vine to waste is a blackberry's worst fate. Surely nothing would pick the unappetizing blackberry. Crow, who would eat from the patch every day, eventually spotted the blackberry and was shocked to see it was not perfect like all the others. No one will pick you unless you ripen up, said Crow. I cannot grow, Crow. I am perhaps destined to stay small and bitter, never to become the perfect blackberry, and nor do I wish it. To think I could have been like my fellow blackberries. They are unkind, and I don't want perfection if it means to have no compassion or empathy, said the blackberry. The odd berry perplexed Crow. Never had he seen such a blackberry on any bush, so he decided to keep an eye on this one. For something was special about this small blackberry that did not grow. Well, Blackberry, I will come back tomorrow to see if you've begun to ripen, said Crow. Every day, Crow would check on the Blackberry to see if anything had changed. For all Blackberries eventually become ripe. To Crow's surprise, the Blackberry remained the same and only grew in sadness. You have yet to grow, and most of the other Blackberries have been eaten. It seems you are destined to be the last Blackberry in the patch, and will most likely fade on the vine. Crow said to the blackberry. I know, Crow. I hate this vine. It holds so many painful memories. If only I could just pick myself. Then I could just fall upon the earth and splat. But I haven't even the strength to do that, the blackberry said, weeping. Perhaps I can help. I can fly higher than any other crow. I have traveled far, have seen much, and have eaten many kinds of berries. But I have never been so intrigued by any of such as you. If you allow me to pick you, I can free you from this vine and take you far from here, said Crow. If I am picked from the vine, I will quickly die afterwards. But I haven't much time left anyway. Will you promise to eat me? asked the blackberry. Of course. And the things you will see as I carry you far from this patch will make you forget all the horrible memories you have here, and you may die in peace, answered Crow. So be it. Free me from this accursed vine, screamed the blackberry. Crow nodded, and with a swift motion, he plucked the little blackberry with his claw and took flight. The blackberry looked down as they quickly ascended further up into the sky, as the forest canopy grew smaller beneath them. The higher they flew, the more of the world beyond the blackberry patch could be seen, and it was much more amazing than the blackberry could ever fathom. Tears of joy and pain swelled in the blackberry's eyes as it only managed to squeak out one word. Beautiful said the blackberry. The blackberry could see hills, fields, streams, and the many trees that dotted the valley floor, things that no other blackberry had ever seen. The blackberry began to cough and became weaker each second after being picked from the vine. The blackberry was starting to die. What is that? asked the blackberry. It's called a sunset. I bet you never expected to see such a spectacular sight as this from the patch said Crow. The blackberry gave no response. Crow looked down to his talons, which now held the lifeless body of the blackberry. Crow closed his eyes and sighed. He continued to fly to his favorite tree, where he planned to fulfill the blackberry's final wish by eating it. 
For a blackberry to be eaten and enjoyed is the hope for all blackberries who grow. However, Crow landed upon the ground next to his favorite tree and not in it, and instead gently set the lifeless blackberry down and began to dig a small grave with his beak, uttering small prayers that only a crow would know. Breaking his promise and defying the blackberry's last wish, Crow instead buried the blackberry in the soft dirt beside the tree. Crow sat in silence, watching the final rays of the setting sun disappear behind the hills, as a voice came from behind. Crow? Crow turned around to see his old friend Owl behind him looking puzzled. Crow nodded quietly in acknowledgement. What troubles you? I've never seen you so gloom, asked Owl. Do you enjoy a blackberry from time to time, Owl? Crow asked. Of course. What do you even mean by mentioning that? You're not one for small talk, answered Owl. Never mind, said Crow. Crow departed abruptly into the night sky as he left Owl puzzled and slightly offended by his short response. Owl looked at the small fresh grave and wondered to what could be bothering Crow so much before he too flew off into the warm night. The seasons went by as the sun would shine and the rain would fall and a sprout began to grow atop the grave of the blackberry. The sprout grew into a huge, lush blackberry bush that produced the most beautiful blackberries anyone had ever seen. With each passing season, the blackberries became more delicious than the season before, and eventually surpassed all the blackberry bushes in the entire valley. For generations, the creatures of the valley ate the sweet blackberries from the bush, which eventually grew larger than any other. The blackberry bush was a place of peace, for all creatures of the valley gathered there to share in its bounty. However, peace would not last. Chapter 2 It was a warm afternoon as Fox was making his way across the valley, searching for small snacks and treasures as he often did. Fox possessed a particular item, a knapsack fastened to his back which he had found while exploring through the old tunnels dug out by his ancestors long since gone. It was an odd item, never before seen in the valley, for this pack was created and sewn together with a small colorful patch on it. No creature in the valley could have ever made such an item, and where it came from was a complete mystery. Fox, however, was able to figure out that the shoulder straps and the flap on top that sealed shut with the pull of a zipper. He had realized the unknown creator's intended purpose for the foreign item, it was a bag in which to carry things upon one's back. It fit well on Fox, and he made good use of it. Carrying his loot from searching the forest, the pack had plenty of room for extra food, feathers, and rocks. As he carried on his way, the serene silence of the forest was disrupted by a growling voice from behind. Fox spun around to see a badger arching its back and letting out a low growl, bearing many sharp teeth. The badger seemed to be taken off guard by Fox's sudden presence and did not appear pleased. You, stop. What is that contraption on your back? The badger demanded. What, this thing? It's hardly a contraption. More like a bag to carry things that you can put on your back. I use it to collect items that I find throughout the valley. When it's full, I store my collected treasure in the old fox tunnels for safekeeping. I have quite the collection of skulls, feathers, and stones. Fox answered. Silence. I know of no such tunnels. You're lying, interrupted the badger. Fox knew that badgers were dangerous, and had to be careful if he wished to survive this encounter. Fox spoke in the most respectful tone that he could as not to further antagonize the badger, who was far out of his territory, the banished zone where all the badgers lived. I'm not lying. The old tunnels were carved many generations ago by my ancestors. It remains the largest network of tunnels ever dug, and they were used in the war as escape routes. I myself haven't even come close to exploring them all. But that's where I store my loot, said Fox. The badger's eyes lit up as the thought of bounty of treasures overcame its aggressive stance towards Fox. There must be untold amounts of treasure and riches in there, the badger exclaimed. Fox was beginning to sweat with apprehension, nervous of the unstable and violent temperament of the badger kind, and with good reason. You will take me there, and perhaps I will spare your life, snarled the badger. Fox quickly developed a plan to escape not trusting the badger to spare him if he shared the location of the tunnels. It's not safe down there. Only nimble foxes can safely navigate the tunnels, which are intricate and dangerous. The tunnels are old and often collapse. It's easy to get lost, and if one is not careful, 
you can fall into one of the many deep pits and never be seen again. The badger began to growl, becoming increasingly angry with the smart-mouthed fox that was seemingly unafraid of its threat. Those are greedy fox lies. Take me to the tunnels now so I may liberate you from your wealth. If you do not comply willingly, I will force you to show me, demanded the badger. Without even waiting for a response from Fox, and in a fit of blind rage, the badger lunged towards Fox, bearing sharp fangs and claws. Fox narrowly evaded the assault by leaping to the side, rolling as he hit the ground, sending a cloud of dust into the air before bolting off into a field nearby. The badger quickly spun around and took chase after Fox. Get back here, yelled the badger. Not on your life, Fox barked back. Fox then began to run at full speed towards a section of tall grass and disappeared into the dense vegetation. The badger became even more frustrated and clumsily lumbered his way into the grass, losing sight of Fox. You cannot hide from me, the badger cried out loud. Fox cut off to the side and laid low on his stomach, hiding in the tall grass, quiet and still, for the beast that pursued was now set on murder. Fox thought quickly and beckoned from his hiding place in a teasing tone in an attempt to lure the badger closer. Fox then started shoving some large stones together in front of himself forming a small barricade that was hidden in the grass. I bet you can't find me, mocked Fox. Fox could hear the badger stop and turn towards his hiding place as the rustling noise of grass grew louder. The badger was headed straight towards him. As the sound of the badger's paws pounding on the ground came closer, Fox hoped he had set out enough rocks. The badger finally got close enough to see bits of Fox's fur through the grass, but he could not see the rocks that Fox had laid out in front of his path. There you are. You should have kept your mouth sh Before the badger could finish its threat, its right front paw struck one of the large dense stones that Fox had laid out for him as a trap. The badger howled as it fell back in pain, clutching its paw. It had broken a few small bones and even chipped the tip of a claw, smashing it right into the rock. Fox took his chance and ran right past the temporarily incapacitated badger, taking a bite in the badger's backside as he ran by causing a painful puncture wound, which drew a decent amount of blood. As the badger cried out again from the bite, Fox quickly darted back into the grass and out of sight. Angrier than ever, the badger cursed aloud as it clutched the injured paw. The badger shook off its injuries and began to chase Fox once more, limping from a broken paw and a painful fox bite. Hindered but determined with rage, the badger again took chase. Badgers were known to be tough and stubborn. Fox headed for one of the many entrances that led down to the complex and ancient network of tunnels, all the while coaxing the badger to chase him. And before long, the entrance of the tunnel was in sight. Covered by roots and moss, the entrance was hard to see and invisible to those who didn't know of it. Fox dove right into the entrance, making sure the badger could see him enter and to be sure that he would follow him in. Okay, first left, then right at the rock, then down, then straight. Hopefully this badger can follow me that far that fox. Fox had known this section of the tunnels quite well, having frequented that area many times before. He knew exactly where the dangerous pitfalls were, including most of the entrances and exits. After several minutes of twists and turns, Fox came to a particular rock placed in the ceiling of the tunnel, perfectly set in the dirt above. Fox stopped and used his nose and front paws to push up on the stone, which began to move upwards until sunlight peeked around its edges. The stone then popped out on the surface of the forest floor. Fox leapt out of the tunnels into the daylight and quickly shoved the stone back into place. He had escaped the tunnels with the use of a secret entrance, one of many built throughout the tunnels for quick access to the outside. Hopefully the badgers can't figure that one out, Fox muttered. Fox knew that badgers weren't known for their intellect, and tricking the badger had proved to be quite easy. He was lucky to have escaped untouched. And sure enough, in his blind pursuit, the badger ran right past the secret entrance, paying no mind to the stone stuck in the ceiling of the tunnel. Not realizing that Fox was no longer ahead in the dark tube, the badger continued on for minutes before he became tired and had to stop for air. Curse that fox. When I catch him, I will crush his skull with my paws, yelled the badger enraged. Frustrated, the lost and injured badger made its way hopelessly through the dark tunnel, limping in pain from a broken paw in a fox bite, uttering curses towards the fox that outsmarted and escaped its wrath. The badger then slipped and fell headfirst into a pitfall. The badger screamed in terror as it fell to the bottom of the pit, many feet down, cracking its neck on impact. 
Fox knew that once in the tunnels, the chances of the badger finding a way out were slim. As he sat upon the rock on the forest floor, he was quite pleased at his own cunning for escaping the dangerous badger. That badger belongs to the tunnels now, Fox laughed to himself. Just then, Fox's laughter was interrupted by a voice, this time from above and in a calm tone. Fox peered upwards to see an old owl sitting atop a tree branch. I saw you lead that badger into the tunnels. You must have known it would not survive, said Owl. The badger was warned of the danger and chose to chase me anyway. I was only trying to defend my own life, Fox replied. You seem to take pleasure in the badger's fate, said Owl. For all we know, the badger could still be alive, countered Fox. We both know that's not true. Those tunnels are haunted with the spirits of many poor creatures who wandered in there not realizing the dangers. That's why your fox ancestors sealed the tunnels for good, said Owl. There are no spirits in those tunnels, it's just dirt and holes down there. I've spent much time in the tunnels, I've never seen a ghost. That's just superstition. I don't believe in such nonsense, said Fox. Owl narrowed his eyes. He was impressed by the cleverness of the young fox who had survived a badger attack. There is much you don't understand. You seem to have a strong resistance to magic if you can't see the spirits of the tunnel. I see many spirits all around. Trust me, they're in those tunnels, and most of them are not pleasant. Perchance I can make you my apprentice. Despite your beliefs, you're still quite capable of saving yourself with your own clever wit. Be your apprentice? What exactly do you do? Fox asked. I am the owl shaman of the valley, answered Owl. Fox had heard of the legendary magic creatures that fought in the war ever since he was a kid, and the Owl Shaman was the greatest hero of them all. Although he had always thought the story was made up, he was now beginning to ignore his beliefs, not realizing that he was already under the spell of Owl, who had chosen him to be his pupil. Owl dropped down a necklace adorned with a mouse skull and some feathers. Owl motioned for Fox to put it on. Fox examined the necklace by sniffing it looked back up at Owl, and then back down at the odd trinket curiously. Go ahead, do not fear it. Any doubts you have will be quelled with that around your neck, said Owl. Unsure, but entranced, Fox picked up the necklace in his teeth and threw it around his neck. For a brief moment, there was silence. Fox looked down to the mouse skull around his neck as Owl watched from above. Fox's ears perked up and his eyes widened as the mouse skull's eyes began to glow. Fox gasped at the magical item that began to entangle with his own essence. Fox's eyes became dilated, and he was overcome with a deep sense of calm as the necklace was now bound to him. The necklace's power was now granted to Fox, and by putting it on, he was now the owl shaman's apprentice. It was done. Fox was unafraid and looked upon Owl, who had flown down to the ground, and now was eye level with him. You have just been granted your first magical item, Fox. Are you afraid? asked Owl. No, answered Fox. Good. The necklace should have that effect. Are you ready for your first lesson? asked Owl. Yes, answered Fox. As he could feel the power from his new magically charged necklace, Fox understood much more now than he ever had before and fully trusted Owl, who is now his new teacher. I can see things in my mind. I can't explain it, but it feels right, said Fox. You will be able to harness magic now, Try this, look to that leaf, close your eyes, and imagine it in flames, instructed Owl. Owl then pointed to a small dry leaf on the ground. Fox did as his new master instructed and focused on the leaf, imagining it on fire. The leaf burst into flames, instantly turning into a black crisp. It happened so quickly that Fox became startled and lost his footing, crashing to the ground. You might have to get used to that, not bad for a first attempt. It appears I have chosen my apprentice wisely laughed Owl. Then, crashing through the bushes, two angry badgers bearing vicious fangs charged towards them. Owl quickly flapped his wings and rose above the ground. He then grabbed Fox by his knapsack straps, lifting his new apprentice off the forest floor, flying high above the trees and escaping their attackers. Fox peered down at the world below, feeling nervous having never been up that high, let alone flying through the air in the clutches of Owl Shaman's talons. Fox looked down into the eyes of the mouse skull again and was overcome with a sense of calm. That was too close. Those badgers will be hunting us now for sure, said Owl. 
Where are we going? asked Fox. To my tree. We will be safe there, Owl answered. As Owl flew through the sky clutching Fox in his talons, Fox realized he had never had such a good view of the valley before and thought to himself how beautiful it was from above. Chapter 3 It had been 197 moons since liftoff, 19 moons since the main system shut down, and the orbiting space shuttle had only been running on backup power cells. With only 8 moons of space rations left, and unable to establish any radio contact, Coyote spoke into the ship's intercom radio. Shuttle to base. This is Planet Lever 1. Repeat, this is Planet Lever 1. The ship has experienced a massive systems failure, and I'm lo running low on food and power. I need immediate assistance. The only response was a crackling static. Coyote had spent hours trying to reach mission control with no success. Ever since the main systems had been knocked out by a solar flare, at least according to the last computer readings recorded on the ship's log. I won't be able to last much longer. Help should have come by now. Am I really that far gone? Coyote asked himself. Coyote let out a large sigh while placing his head against the glass of the starboard window while peering out into the infinity of space. After a moment of silence, Coyote slowly shut his eyes, let out another sigh, and quietly muttered to no one, All for science. He started thinking back on the extensive and difficult training that it took in order to become a C-class officer and pilot of the CSF, the Coyote Space Force. The risk was known from day one of training, that once in space, one may not return home. Coyote slammed his paw against the window in desperate frustration. There has to be a way to get back, Coyote said aloud. At that moment, Coyote's ears perked up and years of studying space engine mechanics kicked in. He began to excitedly scramble around the ship looking for tools and schematics. I got it. If I redirect the power from the communication system and navigation controls to the engine battery and redirect the oxygen supply to help ignite the jet, it will create a temporary burst of energy that will send me back to the planet's surface. I won't be able to control where I land, but it's my only chance. Coyote spent the next few hours rigging the ship's engine to the oxygen supply. A complicated procedure which involved him leaving the ship in a spacesuit to rewire the circuit boards accessible only from the outside of the ship's hull. Finally, back on board, Coyote was ready to begin the emergency boost sequence. He started pushing buttons, twisting knobs, running back and forth from the side of the craft to the other, making countless calculations and adjustments. Finally, Coyote stopped and glanced out the window towards the surface of the planet. Then at the big blue button. The ignition button. Taking a deep breath, Coyote closed his eyes and hit the button with his paw. Boom! A tremendous bright flame exploded from behind the ship, sending the shuttle straight towards the planet's surface. Holding on tight and safely harnessed in the captain's chair, Coyote braced for impact. Back down in the valley, the wandering skunk looked up into the bright light, shimmering up across the sky at high speeds. While back in the shuttle, lights were flashing and alarms were wailing. The ship's structure had exceeded its maximum g-force limit. Coyote had become unconscious due to the high speeds and the ship was close to impact. Luckily, the automated crash parachute opened, operating flawlessly, and the space vessel began to slow down. Within a few moments, the ship had roughly landed in a thick section of forest in the valley below, with only a single skunk to witness the spectacle. I wonder what that thing is. Maybe it's got food in it, the skunk thought to herself. The skunk was now running towards the steaming hunk of shiny metal, the likes of which had never been seen in the forest. The skunk stopped just shy a few feet of the wreck and gazed at it with curiosity. She began to sniff around the edges of the craft. Just then, an automatic door activated, causing the skunk to jump back with surprise. Steam poured out of the craft as the door opened with a loud hiss. The skunk continued to sniff the air while stepping closer to the wreck. As the skunk got closer to the open door, she peered inside and saw an unconscious coyote with a cracked space helmet strapped into a chair surrounded by control panels. Hey, are you alright? Um, hello? Asked the skunk as she nudged the coyote's leg with her nose. Coyote woke up startled by the touch of the skunk's wet nose and instinctively reacted by pushing the skunk, knocking her to the ground. 
Back off, barked Coyote. Skunk's eyes began to well up in tears as she rubbed her cheek where Coyote's paw had struck. Please don't eat me. I'm sorry. I'll leave. Just don't push me again, cried the skunk as she scrambled up from the ground, preparing to flee. Becoming more awake and alert by the second, Coyote realized that the skunk was harmless and felt bad for pushing her. However, he had pulled off the complicated engine burst maneuver and survived the emergency landing. Wait, I'm alive? It worked, Coyote exclaimed. He shook off the cracked, heavy space helmet and began to inspect the shuttle damage and his new surroundings, which looked nothing like home. Then, finally, towards the skunk, who was staring at the alien space coyote with admiration and amazement. You, skunk, where have I landed? Coyote asked. Why, you're in the forest, silly, answered the skunk. I know that. What forest? What nation is this? asked Coyote, frustrated. There is no nation, only forests and fields. Not really sure what a nation is, answered the skunk. Great. I've landed in uncharted zone, probably on the other side of the planet, Coyote thought to himself. That sure is an interesting thingy you got there. I've never seen something so shiny. You must be magic, said the skunk. Ha! This is a Class C spacecraft. It is far from magic. Unless you consider math and science magic, scoffed Coyote. Well, it seems like magic to me, said Skunk sadly. Fine, magic, whatever. What forest is this? asked Coyote, annoyed. This is the forest, the only one I know, answered the skunk. There's more than one forest, skunk, Coyote said, beginning to realize that perhaps the skunk, although cute, was not that smart. The conversation came to an abrupt end as a large commotion came from some nearby bushes as three badgers emerged and quickly surrounded them. This fox may be the puny runt who killed our comrade, said one of the badgers. The badgers began to close in around Coyote and the hapless skunk that was now shaking with fear. I'm not a fox, I'm a coyote, and I haven't killed anyone, Coyote said. Doesn't matter if you did. We can't just let you go. What if you're lying? All foxes are liars, answered one of the badgers. You better be careful. This fox is magic. Can't you see the crash star of magic made behind us? This fox not afraid of you badgers, said the skunk bravely. Shut up, skunk, demanded one of the badgers. It's science, not magic, and I'm not a fox, yelled Coyote. Hardly looks like magic to me, laughed one of the badgers. Fed up with the current state of the situation, Coyote activated the laser watch that was on his left wrist. The watch began to glow as the laser beam charged up. I'm sorry your friend was killed, but I had nothing to do with it. You need to move on or else I'll have to defend myself, Coyote warned. That doesn't matter. Things are about to change in the forest and there's no room for foxes or whatever you are anymore, said the badger. Coyote lifted his laser watch up towards the closest badger as they moved in to attack. Coyote fired a laser beam at one of the attacking badgers, instantly vaporizing it into a steaming skeleton that fell upon the forest floor. The other two badgers stared in shock, then turned and ran away, trying to escape back to the bushes in fear. They were not fast enough, as one of the fleeing badgers was vaporized by a second blast from Coyote's laser watch. The last badger stumbled and fell to the ground quickly, looking up to see Coyote pointing his weapon right in his face. Click, click, the laser watch sounded as it malfunctioned at the worst possible time, and a huge grin appeared on the remaining badger's face. It looks like your witchcraft has failed you. Now you will pay for what you have done, said the badger. The badger slapped Coyote's paw to the side with a clumsy but powerful swipe, and then pinned Coyote to the ground. The badger began to strike Coyote in the face with its paw repeatedly, causing bits of blood to fly out of Coyote's mouth and nose. Coyote struggled against his much larger and stronger attacker. At this point, the skunk began to scream and activated her stink land, emitting a punishing smell before running away in fear. The badger continued to beat Coyote fiercely without restraint. Prepare yourself for death, yelled the badger. The badger raised a paw for the final kill strike, claws gleaming in the light. Coyote shut his eyes, anticipating the blow. But then, the badger's paw that had been raised and poised for attack spontaneously burst into flames. The badger began to scream in pain as the flame that engulfed its paw quickly spread, covering its entire body. The badger screamed in agony while running in circles for a few moments before succumbing to the flames. 
Fox appeared from the bushes with his mouse skull amulet around his neck glowing bright. Are you all right? asked Fox. Coyote slowly got up dazed, coughing, and covered tail to nose with dust and blood. The skunk had been watching from the safety of some nearby bushes, where she had hidden herself. But now that things had calmed down, the skunk was curious again. Yeah, I think so. Thanks for the help, answered Coyote. We've had a badger problem around here lately, said Fox. Fox looked over to the downed spacecraft and back at Coyote, who was a creature he'd never seen before. You're not from here, are you? Fox asked. No, I'm not, Coyote answered. I'd love to hear the story, but it's far too dangerous to stay here. You should come with me. I'm Fox. Coyote didn't hesitate to trust the animal that had saved him. This must have been the fox the badgers were after, and it was obvious whose side to take at this point. Coyote nodded and went to the wrecked ship and retrieved the space pilot hat issued by the CSF unit he had worked on so hard to become a part of. The blue cap had a stitched-on patch with the shape of a star to signify that he was a ranked space pilot, but it was also handy to keep the sun out of his eyes. Coyote assessed the ship's first aid kit as well and bandaged his wounds from the crash and vicious badger attack. All right, Fox, lead the way. You can call me Coyote, Coyote said, adjusting his space cap. Fox nodded as they high-fived paws in greeting and turned away to lead them from the crash site towards Owl's Tree. They traveled for some time as the sun began to set into the twilight of dusk. They reached the base of a mossy tree where Owl had lived for many seasons. Inside, Owl sat eating various bugs next to a fire in the center of the room that did not give off smoke, but burned hot. Owl then sensed his apprentice presence, but also that of another creature. Curious, said Owl as he crunched another roasted bug in his beak. At the base of the tree, Fox paused and asked Coyote, You're unlike most of the foxes I see. What breed are you? I'm a coyote from the Desert Nation and a space pilot with the CSF, Coyote answered. Never heard of the desert, or of a coyote, but by the looks of your gear and your craft, I'm guessing you're from far away. I used to think this valley was the whole world, but Owl has taught me that the world stretches beyond this place. But he's never mentioned a desert before, said Fox. Yes, I'm beginning to think that this may be the other side of the globe. My species are avid explorers, but we still have many areas of our maps uncharted. That was my mission, to explore new territories and map them out. But I had to crash land my ship here, said Coyote. Fox nodded. He had learned a lot from becoming Owl's apprentice and was not surprised. The world held much mystery, and one must be open to the unknown. This is a mystical tree in which the Owl Shaman has lived for many seasons. He is wise, powerful, and will heal your wounds. He knows more about the outside world than anyone, and he may be able to help you get back home, said Fox. Good. Maybe I can get some answers and get back home to share my findings. This must be further than any CASF pilot has ever gone before, said Coyote. The entire tree was covered in a thick green moss, all around and up to the top. Fox leapt up to a low branch and hopped upwards from branch to branch. Coyote followed until they reached the entrance, where the light from within poured out, and peering inside, Coyote could see the flickering shadow of an owl upon a fire-lit wall. Chapter 4 Inside the hollowed tree, Owl sat peacefully by a fire and beckoned his guests to enter with a wave of his wing. The two animals entered and sat next to the fire, opposite of Owl, who was quietly eating bugs as he glanced at Fox then to their new guest. Coyote looked around the room, slightly overwhelmed by the many strange carvings and pictographs scratched across every square inch of the walls inside. "'Who is your friend, Fox?' asked Owl. "'He fell from the sky in a magic craft of some sort,' answered Fox. "'He's a coyote, distant relatives of yours, settled in a far-off land called the desert. "'I must say, it has been some time since I've seen your kind,' answered Owl." Fox glanced towards Coyote curiously. The animals seemed so similar, and yet there was a distinctive difference. You are far from home. What has brought you here? asked Owl. I had to make an emergency crash landing after being adrift in space for many moons aboard my ship. It sustained heavy damage when a solar flare fried half the systems on board. I wasn't sure where I would land or if I'd survive the crash, but it was my only option, 
answered Coyote. Owl nodded in full understanding, for even though mastered in the art of magic, he had come to know of the scientific advancements of the coyotes through travel beyond the valley, and meditative visions induced by holistic bug consumption. Although Owl did not personally believe in the use of science, he had a great respect for the wonders that science had produced. Owl did not try to bother to try to teach the concept of science to the creatures of the valley because it held no bearing in the ways of the locals, and would only confuse and frighten them. Perhaps introducing science to the valley would inspire some of the animals to use it to gain an unfair and unnatural advantage. It would surely turn the valley realm upside down, and potentially destroy the simple creatures that lived happy lives without it. Coyotes love to explore, and have traveled wide and far, even to the stars above putting most of their energy into scientific discovery and adventure. They could not fly naturally, so they created machines that could travel long distance for them. The coyotes used to dwell here, but decided to leave, for the valley was not large enough for their wanderlust. Eventually all the coyotes were gone, settled far from here, surely to have forgotten this place. Apparently the desert is a safer place to study aeronautics and pilot spaceship prototypes. Fewer trees to crash into, I suppose, said Owl. Wait, how do you know that stuff? Coyote interrupted. Owl knows many things learned from years of practicing magic and world travel, answered Fox. Ha! Wise, perhaps. But a shaman? I doubt it. Coyote barked sarcastically. How dare you insult him? Fox growled at Coyote, bearing the tip of a fang. Owl interrupted the two creatures by using a wing to create a feathery wall between them, rotating his head towards Fox. You see, Fox, you must understand that coyotes don't believe in the ways of magic. It's a large reason why they are no longer a part of our realm. Not only did they like to explore, but they did not agree with the use of magic. They perceived the practices as inherently evil. The science they use does seem like magic, but I assure you, it's quite different, Owl explained to Fox. Owl moved his wings between them, having noticed Fox's express change from anger to understanding, as he popped yet another bug into his beak with a loud crunch. Magic is a myth. It's not backed by science. Some of the things you say are true, like the desert and the love of exploration that drives our species to the stars. But magic? You must be mistaken. Everything can be explained by science except magic. Therefore, it must not exist, said Coyote. Owl focused his gaze towards Coyote, narrowed his eyes, and cocked his head in an awkward fashion, turning his face completely upside down. Are you so sure? asked Owl. The smokeless flame flared up three times its prior size. The markings and pictographs that covered the walls began to glow and a small gust of wind began to circulate the room. Coyote hopped back startled as a vision began to appear in the flames in front of them. The vision in the flames showed Coyote's spacecraft sitting in the forest floor, smoldering and overrun with badgers, tearing it apart, searching for clues or survivors in the craft. A pair of pale yellow eyes, surrounded by black fur, peered out from a nearby bush overseeing the badger's search. Is that a security camera? How can you see this? What are they doing to my ship? asked Coyote. Your ship is advanced. No wonder it seems like magic. You coyotes have come a long way. Perhaps I should have kept a better eye on the technological advancements of your species. The last coyote spacecraft I saw was made of sticks and heavy balloons, powered by a burning flame, Owl answered. That design is hundreds of seasons old. How long have you lived? asked Coyote. Longer than you would believe, Coyote, for my age defies science, answered Owl. You got that right, exclaimed Coyote. Just then, Fox let out a sneeze, along with a burst of flame that burned his own whiskers, which caused Coyote to jump back in surprise. Apprentice, please control your flames in front of our guest, scolded Owl. Fox rubbed his nose and nodded apologetically. A look of confusion came over Coyote, who now hoped this was all a dream. Maybe he had died in the crash, and this was some sort of crazy afterlife. Coyote nipped his paw with his fang, and a sharp sense of pain proved that this was no dream, and not an afterlife. Coyote was stuck in a far-off land where magic and trees seemed to dominate the creatures of the realm. Perhaps there was a scientific explanation, but not one that Coyote could come up with. One thing was certain, Coyote needed to get help to get back home, and there was no choice but to trust this odd duo. Can you help me get back to the desert? I don't belong here, asked Coyote. You are very far from home, and you may be for some time. Your ship is destroyed, and I cannot use magic to fix it. And I am far too old to fly you back. 
It's a long and deadly journey to the other side of the world, and is nearly impossible even for the strongest of birds, which I am no longer, answered Owl. But I want to go home. I've explored enough. You have to help me, Coyote said sadly. Maybe in time we can figure something out, but for now you must stay with us. It's far too dangerous to be out in the woods alone, especially as of late. The badgers are roaming the realm in large numbers, crossing into the forbidden areas that they agreed to void many seasons ago. They have started breaking the ancient treaty, and there is dark magic present in our forest once again, and I fear soon things will become dangerous for all creatures. You picked an interesting time to crash here, Coyote, and I can't deal with this alone, which is why I have decided to make Fox my apprentice, to assist me when the evil becomes out of my control, said Owl. Many seasons ago, there was an endless war that Owl fought against with his once friend who became evil, Wolf and his badger army. Many lives were lost, and after hundreds of seasons, the war finally ended, with the badger army eventually decimated by casualties. Wolf was forced to yield and was banished to an isolated grove to the east, said Fox. I nearly killed Wolf in battle all those seasons ago, and it seems he has returned. Perhaps I shouldn't have spared his life. Wolf and I were both apprentices of Master Bear, who was once the most powerful being in the valley, until one day Wolf betrayed our master and murdered him in cold blood. Then Wolf gathered an army of badgers who were easily put under his spell. They were formidable soldiers, and with them, Wolf tried to take over the valley. I, being the only creature that rivaled the magic strength of Wolf, had no choice but to rally an army of my own to defeat him and his minions. Coyote, many of your ancestors fought and died in that war, and soon left the realm after, not being able to find peace here after losing faith in magic. I tried to keep in contact with them, but they traveled so far. I suppose that's what they wanted to get as far away from here as possible, said Owl. I've never heard any of this from the history lessons at the academy, said Coyote. Lost in time, I suppose, said Owl. Why would Wolf come back now? What does he have to gain? asked Coyote. The blackberry bush, answered Owl. Just a blackberry bush? That's ridiculous, said Coyote. This was no ordinary bush, said Fox. Let me guess. It's a magic bush, Coyote responded sarcastically. Owl slowly shut his eyes, dropped his head towards his feathery chest, and sighed. No, it wasn't magic. The blackberries found on the bush were rivaled by no other. They were the sweetest ever tasted, and the legend of the blackberry bush was known by all. The creatures of the valley shared in its bounty, and the blackberry bush was a place where different species could meet despite their differences. They all agreed on one thing, the unequal deliciousness of the best blackberries. The blackberry bush ushered in an air of balance and peace throughout the valley, and Master Bear believed that this bush was essential for maintaining our environment's equilibrium. Over time, Wolf began to disagree with the philosophy, and felt that we should use our magic to keep control over the blackberry bush and the creatures that ate from it. I, of course, thought this to be ludicrous and unfair, but after living for an untold amount of seasons, the ancient Master Bear had become foggy-minded. That's when Wolf made his move by murdering Master Bear to usurp control over the blackberry bush. Because of our magic, Wolf and I age far slower than the other creatures, and I've witnessed many generations of them, all species dying in the ongoing war for the blackberry bush. When the war was finally over, I was stricken with grief over the seasons upon seasons of leading countless creatures to their deaths, fighting Wolf and his army. I had no choice and their sacrifice saved our valley from utter destruction. But the pain could not be undone, said Owl. Coyote sat still, not completely sure if this crazy story was remotely true, still thinking that perchance this was a dream, induced by a coma brought on by a cryogenic tube sleep, a method used in space travel for extended missions. Doubts aside, Coyote had to rely on the current facts that this was all real, and that he was very far from home. Although he had been hoping, Coyote had a strong sense that this was not a dream. However, as Owl continued to speak, there was a presence in his voice that calmed Coyote as the story unfolded, and Coyote no longer felt like interrupting with scientific doubts. I believe Wolf has returned to recreate the blackberry bush, which was destroyed by the very war it caused. Due to neglect and seasons of battles, eventually the blackberry bush could not sustain itself and died. 
Though the blackberry bush was gone, several surviving seeds were gathered and hidden away soon after. I asked my friend Crow to hide the seeds for me and not tell anyone where they were. For the seeds' safekeeping, no one could know. Wolf is now after the seeds and plans to take over the valley once again, and we must warn Crow right away, although I haven't spoken to him in many seasons. After the war ended, nothing was quite the same between us. Now that Wolf has crossed the treaty line, we must find the seeds immediately, said Owl. Coyote sat in the hollow tree, staring at the two creatures who claimed to be magic. It seemed Coyote had crash-landed at the tail end of a magical war over blackberries. Still wounded from the crash, Coyote winced in pain, more proof that this was not a dream. Owl noticed the pain look Coyote had on his face, and quickly scoured the floor, littered with different colored and exotic bugs. Owl then picked up one with his talon and tossed it over to Coyote, motioning for him to eat the bug. Coyote looked at the bug curiously. It was not exactly tasty looking, but it couldn't have been worse than the space rations Coyote had been eating for months while floating in orbit. Coyote sniffed the bug and picked it up in his teeth and began to chew. Within seconds, Coyote's ears perked up and feeling a flow of energy through his body. Coyote's wounds began to heal, and by the time the bug was swallowed, Coyote was better than ever and felt energetic as a pup. I feel amazing, exclaimed Coyote. Yes, the bugs will do that, agreed Owl. Coyote, would you like to come with us to warn Crow? asked Owl. Coyote had doubted Owl's story of magic, but as he felt the power of the bug, he started to forget those feelings of doubt and began to take what Owl was saying more seriously. Enchanted by Owl's magic, Coyote was becoming more agreeable to the idea that perhaps this was real and that he did want to help. Well, I don't want to sit around here by myself in some stump all alone, I guess, said Coyote. Some stump? This has been my home for seasons countless, said Owl angrily as he threw his wings up in the air. I should have stayed up in space, lost and drifting in nothingness, I guess, Coyote thought to himself. Owl calmed himself by lowering his wing and asked again in a firmer tone, realizing that Coyote had a particular sense of humor, perhaps. Would you like to come with us, Coyote, to see Crow? We may need help, asked Owl a second time. Coyote nodded in agreement and looked at Fox, who nodded back, as the magic bug settled in Coyote's stomach. Coyote felt more connected to the two creatures that sat with him in the hollow tree located in the unknown valley that had been his crash site. He was the first coyote to set paw in the valley in many hundreds of seasons. Coyote was in a predicament, but it was turning into something far more interesting than collecting data and plotting maps on a routine space orbit mission. This was actually exciting. Chapter 5 Since I can't carry you both during flight, we will walk to Crow's tree, said Owl. As they rallied at the base of the mossy tree, Owl turned towards the forest and began to walk awkwardly, essentially waddling into the night. The moon was bright and it was easy to see their way into the darkness. A warm wind blew through the fur of the two companions as they watched Owl wobbling along in front of them. It was odd to see an Owl walk upon the ground since they always traveled by flight, and because of Owl's short legs, their pace was quite slow. The moonlight guided the creatures through a small open field surrounded by dense forest, to which at the other side was a patch of trees slightly taller than the rest. As they got closer, Owl explained that it had been many seasons, and he couldn't quite remember which one of the trees that Crow actually lived in. However, while standing at the base of the tallest tree, and quietly contemplating, a single acorn fell straight down and landed square on Owl's head, making a dull clunk noise. Owl instantly began to clutch his head in pain from the impact of the small missile. From above them, a voice caught out. There's your acorn. Now be gone, said Crow. Fox and Coyote looked at each other confused, then looked up to see the dark silhouette of a bird. Leave, I say, Crow cawed. Slightly dazed from the acorn impact, Owl interjected. This was a delicate matter between old friends, and magic would be of no use. Wait, I need to talk to you. I know it's been a while, but it's urgent, pleaded Owl. You wish to talk? 
Perhaps I'll consider it if you apologize, said Crow. The utmost apologies, Crow. Will you please stop this pettiness and come speak to me? It's important, Owl asked. Fox was curious why Crow seemed so angry, but decided that it was best not to ask. Fox had learned that silence is sometimes the best, even when curiosity strikes. Then, in a swift movement, Crow leapt from the branch above and glided down to the ground, face to face with all three of them. Crow gave a quick cockeyed glance at Owl's two companions, and then, disinterested, turned his attention towards Owl. The moon was straight above in the sky, with thousands of stars speckling around it. The warm breeze had persisted and was gradually blowing harder, and none of the creatures noticed the shifting winds. Old friend, you haven't been by in a long while. I have forgotten why we were no longer speaking. Tell me your business before I remember and ask you to leave said Crow. I need to find the seeds, Crow. You must tell me where you hid them, Owl said in a serious tone, knowing that Crow could easily become agitated and incoherent at any moment. Crow showed no signs of confusion when he immediately denied Owl the information, seemingly loyal to the pact that they had made to keep the hiding spot a secret. Owl began to argue with Crow and explained how the treaty was broken and that the enemy lurked in the shadows once more, like back in the war. None of them realized that they were being watched by two pale, yellow eyes hidden in the darkness of the nearby woods. The group was exposed and fully visible by moonlight, and they did not feel the evil presence watching them. The animals of the forest are not yet ready for the seeds, said Crow. You do not understand, Crow. This isn't so we can replant the bush. Wolf has returned with his army of badgers and is tearing apart the forest looking for you and the seeds, Owl argued, getting more agitated. Only if you apologize, Crow said again. I already have, you crazy bird. Do you even remember where you put them? Owl was beginning to yell. A rustling in the bushes nearby silenced the arguing birds and demanded the attention of them all as they turned to gaze into the pale yellow eyes of Wolf, who suddenly appeared before them. Wolf stamped his paw on the ground, triggering a small earthquake that shook the ground beneath. Small fissures in the ground formed, from which vines came shooting out, entangling all four of them, leaving them completely immobilized. The vines drained Owl and Fox of their magic so they could not escape, and Coyote couldn't reach his laser watch. They were trapped in the vines, only getting more stuck as they struggled to become free. Wolf slowly walked closer and grabbed Crow in his jaws, as the others remained tied and bound. Even their mouths were covered, with the vines muffling their voices as Wolf sped off, disappearing into the dark with Crow in his jaws. The magic vines began to loosen enough for Coyote to activate his laser watch, using the laser beam to make a quick work of the binding vines. Fox began gnawing at the vines to no avail. Finally, his magic returned, and he burst into flames, instantly incinerating each vine holding him captive. Fox began to cough from all the smoke of the burnt vines and shook off the ashes left on his coat. Owl used his sharp talons and beak to free himself as well. For after Wolf had left, the grip of the vines slowly became weaker, and they were able to free themselves. Your wing! exclaimed Fox, staring at Owl's dislocated wing. Well, I don't need magic to fix this, said Owl. Using his other wing, Owl popped his dislocated shoulder back into its proper socket. The cracking noise made Coyote shudder. Owl shrugged off the pain, for they had a bigger problem to deal with. Wolf had taken Crow, and surely soon would be searching for the seeds. We need to track them down. I will search Crow's nest for anything that may help us find the seeds. You two, try to find a scent to track, Owl commanded. Fox and Coyote stuck their noses in the air and began to sniff, trying to pick up any scent that could help indicate where Wolf had gone. Owl flew up the tree to the branch that held Crow's nest, which over the years had grown quite large and full of random items, salvaged over many seasons of lonely searching. After several minutes of rooting through Crow's collection of mostly junk, a rolled-up piece of bark caught Owl's eye. Grabbing the bark scroll, Owl scanned the scratch marks on it that appeared to form an image of a crude blackberry, quickly realizing what Crow had created. Owl's eyes widened, and he grabbed the bark scroll within his talons and flew back down to show Fox and Coyote. What is that? asked Fox. It's a map to the seeds, answered Owl. He unraveled the map and set it upon the ground so they could all inspect it. 
Even in the moonlight, the dark markings were easy to see. Coyote had trouble making sense of it, but Owl and Fox seemed to understand the crudely scratched out landmarks the map portrayed. Where does this map lead? asked Coyote. The map leads to the waterfalls, answered Fox. Yes, the waterfalls. Crow must have hid them there. The map doesn't specify where, but it'll get us close. Wolf must have been following us and was waiting for me to come here so he didn't have to search for Crow. Now Wolf can use his spells or torture to get Crow to confess the exact location of the seeds. Hopefully Crow's insanity will delay the process. That mind is more complex than to be cracked by spells alone, but eventually Wolf will get the information. We have no choice but to get to the waterfalls and find the seeds before Wolf can. But Wolf was so powerful. How can we stop his magic? And what can we do about the Badger army? We can't fight them all, Fox said concerned. We cannot let Wolf get the seeds. His magic is powerful, yes, but we have no choice. I will try to track down Crow and Wolf. You two head straight for the waterfalls, said Owl. He was already in flight as he finished his instructions and headed off far into the night sky, using keen night vision to scan the forest below. Coyote watched as Fox adjusted his pack tighter so it wouldn't slip off before they headed towards the waterfalls. As the pack moved up on Fox's back, the insignia patch on the front caught Coyote's eye. Coyote hadn't really noticed the pack and was surprised to see it, being that in this realm there was no such technology. More surprising still was that the insignia patch was that of an old Coyote Space Cadet unit, one of the first. Coyote had seen it before in his academy books, and chills went down his spine to the tip of his tail. Where did you get that pack, Fox? asked Coyote. I found it. Owl says it's an ancient relic and is quite useful, answered Fox. That patch is from a famous unit that traveled space back when Coyotes first got out into orbit. I learned about it at the CSF Academy. The unit left for a routine mission over 300 seasons ago, never to return. And the mystery was never solved said Coyote. I suppose it must have fallen from the sky like you and your ship. I have to admit, you coyotes come up with some useful inventions with your science, said Fox. They both stared at the pack for a moment, and then Fox looked to Coyote. We best go. The waterfalls are far from here, and we have to get there before Wolf or the, any of the badgers do. It might be our only chance to get the seeds, said Fox. Coyote agreed, still mesmerized by the old pack. It was a fascinating piece of history, and Coyote again wondered how it had gotten so far. It made Coyote realize that this realm, so different, wasn't as far away as it felt, and maybe when this was over, there may just be a way to get back to the desert. Fox quickly darted off in what seemed to be an aimless direction. Coyote followed as they began to run to the waterfalls. As they ran towards the falls, Owl continued to fly high above, searching for Crow and Wolf seeing even more groups of badgers roaming through the forest, searching and patrolling the darkness. Owl was surprised at how many more badger patrols there were. It seemed that they had increased dramatically in number, and quickly. Owl did not know Crow had created the map, and he had hoped with that advantage, maybe they could prevent the seeds from falling into the paws of Wolf. Chapter 6 the glowing moon moved slowly across the sky as the two furry figures made their way across the field and woods, heading towards the waterfalls at the edge of the valley. The area they were headed for had many streams and natural waterfalls, even some perpetual all season long. There were dozens of them, small and large, some even hundreds of feet in height. All the animals regarded it as a sacred place or one could spend days exploring the many falls and streams without ever finding them all. Many would get lost in the mist among the many small canyons and valleys that made up the waterfall region. It was foggy due to the many springs of fresh water, and it was easy to get lost. The perfect place to hide something. The two had stopped briefly to catch a quick breath and drink from a small stream, still having a long way to go. We shouldn't stay here long. I sense something watching us, said Fox quietly. Coyote was taking a cool draw from the stream, and before he could look up at Fox, a large mass flew from the side, tackling Fox and knocking the wind out of his lungs. 
the mask began to pummel Fox, who was rendered unable to use any magic in defense. Coyote growled and began to charge up his laser watch, but was interrupted by another badger's chokehold from behind. They had been ambushed by a particularly aggressive group of badgers, who were large in size and number. There were nine of these brutes, and it had only taken two of them to subdue Fox and Coyote. The rest of the badgers encircled them, as they had become prisoners. The badger who had been assailing Fox ceased and picked him up by the scruff of his neck. Fox was dazed and hardly conscious from the beating, as Fox struggled for air under the badger's forearm that was wrapped around his face. One badger stepped forward and spoke to their newly acquired captives. We have finally found you. You are known to be extremely dangerous and ordered to be killed on sight, for the murder of several badgers is on your paws, the badger said. The circle of badgers grew smaller as they growled, flashing their teeth and claws, not planning to wait long in carrying out their execution orders. Then, from the night sky above, a bright light illuminated the entire group, blinding the badgers as, a, as the light beam shot into the ground around them. Disoriented, the badgers began to growl in confusion as several figures appeared from the beam that hit the ground. The figures then made a formation as a voice rang out. Engage, barked one of the figures. At that command, multiple laser beams shot towards the badgers in a systematic and calculated fashion. Five of the badgers were killed instantly and hit multiple times. The figures moved forward as the remaining badgers tried to flee, dropping their prisoners to the ground, fearing for their own lives. The lasers flew at the badgers relentlessly until the last one was downed with a well-placed shot to the back that burned a hole through its chest. Coyote looked up from the dust after being dropped from the badger's chokehold. The whole incident took less than a minute, and Coyote was still stunned. As the smoke cleared, the figures became visible, and Coyote recognized them immediately. It was an elite CSF tactical team. It appeared to be a top unit, the best the CSF had at its disposal. The gear they donned looked advanced and battle-worn, for it was a team of coyote commandos whose unit only recruited the most experienced and badass of coyotes to perform the most dangerous of missions. The unit leader called out orders for the squad to set up a perimeter around Fox, Coyote, and the now nine dead badgers. This is Gold Team Leader. We have secured the package. We need extraction now the ranking coyote barked into a communication device that was strapped around her wrist. The large beam returned from above as the coyotes got sucked back up into the sky as quickly as they landed. They had successfully conducted the rescue of the lost CSF pilot, whose ship had fallen off the radar weeks before and had been finally located. The top brass put a high priority on the rescue of any lost space pilot, but it didn't usually take this long. However, no space pilot had ever been so far lost. Fox was now left alone on the forest floor with only dead badgers for company, badly beaten, but alive. He was suffering with a headache and a bloody nose, but was strong enough to continue on. The whole incident happened so fast he didn't have time to react with magic. Had those mysterious warriors not come from above, the badgers would have killed them for sure. Coyote was now gone, but there was no choice other than to continue onto the waterfalls alone, and with the obvious increase in danger, time was not to be wasted. Fox looked back sadly to where Coyote had last been before being transported far up into space and had hoped that he was safe. Not wasting any time mourning, Fox bounded off into the night towards the waterfalls at an even faster pace. He had to keep going. In an instant, Coyote was back up in orbit floating in a CSF spaceship. They had beamed up into a space hangar of a large war vessel armed with hundreds of ships. There were dozens of different spacecraft and personnel in the open hangar. This ship was different than Coyote's Exploration Vessel, which was built for speed and extended exploration missions. This particular vessel was a massive spacecraft carrier, and it had traveled all this way to find him. Coyote had been on ships like this many times before and had spent countless hours in space hangars in the past training to become a pilot. Medical personnel surrounded Coyote, all eager to test and detect any symptoms of injury or sickness as they scanned and ran biodiagnostics on the newly rescued pilot. I'm fine. You need to send me back, Coyote yelled. The unwanted entourage looked confused as to why someone who just got rescued from certain death would say that, but did not cease conducting their medical tests. Coyote pushed through the medical staff and went towards the leader of the rescue team. I need to go back. I need to help that fox, said Coyote. My orders were to extract you from the crash site, which has been accomplished. The higher-ups have put a preference over your safety, 
and we just killed nine animals risking our own necks to save you. You're staying here, and we're warping back to our side of the planet. We will be back in two moons, the leader of Gold Team replied as she took off her tactical space helmet. She turned and walked away, not interested in a rebuttal. Orders were orders, and she hadn't moved up that high in the CSF by doing the opposite. The mission was over. Coyote looked around frantically and spotted several types of small spacecraft in the hangar they had beamed up to. Being a Class C pilot, there wasn't a ship, vessel, or vehicle that couldn't be piloted by Coyote, and a certain vehicle caught his eye. Perfect. That will do, thought Coyote. The medical staff had dissipated, losing interest after the bio signs were reading normal for the recently rescued subject, and most of the tactical team had already cleared the hangar. Before leaving through a large metal automatic hatch door, the gold team leader turned to remind the two soldiers that after medical clearance to escort the newly rescued pilot to the debriefing room. The higher-ups had many questions to ask the pilot who had gotten lost on the other side of the world due to a systems malfunction on a very advanced and expensive spaceship. As she turned around to bark the orders, a hangar mechanic howled out. The gold team leader watched in shock as the pilot she had just rescued from a murderous band of badgers was attempting to steal a space vehicle. Hey, you're not cleared for takeoff, a mechanic yelled. That pilot is stealing the SMUV, said another mechanic. Coyote began powering up a bipedal mechanized combat spacesuit equipped with heavy weapons and spaceflight capabilities. Coyote had many hours in mechanized units and had done countless training missions and several actual missions while previously serving in the mechanized assault unit, before becoming a Class C ship pilot. This would be an easy escape. Before anyone could intervene, the SMUV powered on, as status lights began to blink and jets began to pulse with force. Coyote buckled into the safety harness and hit the fly button on the dash. With a blast of the main jet engine, the SMUV shot out of the space hangar back towards the planet below. The gold team leader's jaw dropped as her tactical space helmet hit the floor, cracking its mirrored visor. Chapter 7 While flying silently in pursuit of Wolf, Owl watched with his amazing night vision the groups of marauding badgers now scattered throughout the valley. None of them seemed to notice the dark silhouette of the owl shaman gliding above them in the night sky. After dozens of badger sightings, Owl finally spotted a particular outline that was uniquely Wolf, who was now followed by multiple bodyguards and still had the unconscious crow in his jaws. Somewhere in Crow's brain was the exact location of the seeds, and therefore was needed alive in order for anyone to find them. Owl followed closely to see where Crow was being taken. Owl's pursuit led to the edge of a wide river where upon the other side was the Banished Zone, created by the treaty that ended the war so long before. The treaty was that no one was to cross into or leave the Banished Zone, and anyone who did put their own lives at risk. To keep the peace, the boundary would not be crossed. It was clear now that Wolf had stopped caring for peace and had decided to make a move on taking over the entire valley once again. Wolf wanted to rule with an army of badgers, and if able to grow a new blackberry bush from the ancient seeds, it would be an unstoppable combination. Wolf, who was forced to surrender and accept the treaty due to heavy casualties, had essentially lost the war. Instead of being executed, Wolf was banished with the broken and few badgers that remained of a once feared army, to a small section of the valley and never allowed to return. Shamed and resentful, Wolf had been plotting revenge since the moment the treaty was agreed upon, raising a new army and waiting for the time when once again he could step on the other side of the boundary and wage war. The war had begun with Wolf betraying Master Bear and his fellow pupil of Magic Owl, who had always been more adept to magic due to a profound patience. What Wolf lacked in patience, he made up for in ferocity that sometimes blinded him from right and wrong. Wolf argued with Master Bear constantly about control over the blackberry bush. Master Bear protected the blackberry bush and had recruited Owl and Wolf as pupils in magic to help him. Wolf felt that the potential to exert power over the entire valley and all the animals was being wasted, and the blackberries were far too valuable to let everyone enjoy them freely. 
Master Bear, worried by Wolf's greed, told Wolf many times that the blackberries were for everyone, and that the idea of manipulating other creatures with the blackberries was a sign of evil. Finally, Wolf decided that control over the blackberry bush was best suited for himself alone, and made plans to murder Master Bear and Owl. But with magic alone, Wolf could not defeat them both. Master Bear was wise and powerful, and had lived to be an astounding age. Neither of Master Bear's pupils actually knew the true age of the ancient magic bear that had lumbered about the forest for seasons upon seasons. For one of the benefits of magic was extended life, and those who practiced it could live well beyond a normal lifespan. Although powerful, Master Bear's extended age had begun to cloud his judgment. It proved to be fatal. And despite suspicions of Wolf's intentions and obvious evil nature, Master Bear continued to trust Wolf. Owl warned Master Bear that Wolf had become more dark and silent, only speaking to express discontent for Master Bear's chosen philosophy of free blackberries for all. Wolf was constantly trying to convince Owl that together they could sway Master Bear towards restricting and controlling the blackberries so they alone could decide who could have them. If the other creatures want the blackberries, they should have to pay tribute to us. Think of the wasted trade opportunities, not to mention total control over these non-magic weaklings. We are not here to serve them. We control the bush, not them. Owl knew it was only a matter of time before Wolf would do something more than talk. Sure enough, one evening the three of them were set to conduct a magic ceremony. Each one would need to eat a magic bug to complete the process, and Wolf had poisoned the two bugs meant for Master Bear and Owl. Master Bear and Owl gave no thought to the particular taste of the bugs they ingested, as the three sat around a lit blaze. By the end of the ceremony, Master Bear sat dead from a powerful poison, although Owl had merely fallen asleep. Wolf had made a mistake and did not properly coat enough poison on that particular bug to kill Owl. When Owl awoke, Master Bear lay dead to a smoldering fire, and Wolf had disappeared to summon his army of mercenary badgers. The badgers had been promised a hefty payment if they were to help Wolf take control of the blackberry bush, which by this time had yielded countless of the best blackberries in the valley. At first, Wolf and the army of badgers had put a blockade around the blackberry bush and began killing any creature that tried to break through. Not many did, for none were as powerful as Wolf or the badger army under his command. Owl, having survived his assassination, soon rallied his own army to combat Wolf. Owl's army was made up of all the other animals of the valley, such as skunks, foxes, hawks, crows, squirrels, and snakes to name a few, and of course, the coyotes. Alone, these creatures weren't as fierce as the badgers, but together, and with Owl as their leader, the diverse army proved to be an exceptional fighting force against Wolf's army. For seasons upon seasons, the valley was a constant battlefield. Many animals died, and entire generations knew only war. Owl and Wolf fought against each other for hundreds of seasons, not aging like the troops in their armies. Both of them were trapped in eternal warfare. Many animals hadn't a clue for the reason why they even fought. They only knew a profound hatred for the other side, who had also forgotten why the war was started. The purpose of the war was simply to kill the enemy, and no reason was needed. It was a dark era in the valley. There was eventually a final battle that took place at the site of the blackberry bush, which had been reduced to a small lifeless patch, no longer yielding fruit. With no one to care for it and death all around, the blackberry bush that had started the war had long since died. After hours of fighting in the final battle, Owl had defeated all the badger troops, leaving Wolf surrounded, helpless, and alone. Wolf, you betrayed Master Bear and started a war which has led to the deaths of many good animals. This once bright and beautiful valley now weeps with blood and is littered with the bones and darkness. You have created an era of pain, and this is where it ends. I will spare your life if you take yourself and the remaining badger troops to the eastern grove across the river, never to return and forever banished, said Owl. Wolf, who was tired, battered, and bleeding from the battle, was surprised at Owl's offer. Why spare me? Why not kill me and be done with it? asked Wolf. Owl, who had also been battered by years of war, was weary of all the bloodshed and had seen enough death. I grant you your life out of respect for Master Bear, who you murdered in cowardice. Master Bear believed in compassion towards all, and even though you deserve death, I will not be able to one to grant that for you. 
However, if you do not agree to your banishment, I will have to end your life here and now, said Owl. Wolf was surrounded by Owl's personal combat entourage, animals that had been fighting alongside Owl for their whole lives. They wanted nothing more than tear Wolf apart, but still under Owl's command, they could not. Curse you, Owl. You're a fool just like Master Bear, and your morality will be your end, Wolf howled in anger. And with that, Owl flapped his wings and rose above Wolf, ordering the soldiers under his command to stand down and return home. The foxes, hawks, snakes, and several dozen other species that made up Owl's personal guard all obeyed his order to stand down. As much as they despised Wolf and wanted him dead, they respected their leader even more. The war is over, Wolf, and the blackberry bush is destroyed. Take what remains of the badgers and leave now to the eastern grove, and you must not return. These are the terms of your surrender. All these animals under my command want you dead, more than you could know. I highly suggest you agree to the treaty, said Owl. Wolf was furious, but was not in the position to negotiate, and reluctantly agreed. Wolf growled at Owl a final time, then turned and headed east, picking up the remnants of the badger army along the way, crossed the river towards the eastern grove, banished for all time. Owl looked to the once great blackberry bush, which had become nothing more than a withered patch of sticks. Saddened, Owl flew down next to the dead blackberry bush and clutched some of the earth in his talons. As he lifted up a clump of soil from the ground, letting the dirt slip through his grip, the particles fell. An owl noticed a few gleaming specks among the dirt as he suddenly realized that the specks were actually blackberry seeds. Owl's eyes widened. With them, another bush could be grown, although Wolf could never know of the seeds' existence or war could start again. The seeds had to be hidden until they could be safely planted without worry of Wolf's intention to control the valley with them. The only way the seeds could remain safe is if they were hidden from the world and even hidden from Owl. Owl took the seeds and flew off towards the tree where Crow lived, the only other living creature that was alive in the time of the original blackberry bush. Crow had to be the one to hide the seeds, for he was the one that planted the original bush and could be trusted. Perhaps when the time was right, the valley would be ready for the blackberries once again. Owl met with Crow who agreed to hide the seeds and never tell anyone where they were. With the seeds safely hidden away, Owl returned to the other animals to rebuild the valley and put the war into the past. The dark times were fading and a new era of peace was beginning. Soon the valley returned back to the way it was long before. Owl had always feared that Wolf would return for vengeance. That fear was now realized, and if Owl did not act quickly, Wolf and his army would take over the valley. Owl flew behind the group far enough as not to be detected by Wolf or his bodyguards. They soon arrived to a wide river with the banished zone located on the other side. Wolf summoned a lightning bolt, striking down a large tree, creating a bridge to the other side, with Crow still in his jaws. Wolf leapt upon the tree bridge and began to cross the river with the badger bodyguards following behind. They were headed into the banished zone, an area Owl had not seen since the end of the war. It seemed that Owl would also now be breaking the treaty by crossing the river, but now, after seasons of peace, there was no treaty anymore, and war had begun again. Chapter 8 Fox was running furiously towards the waterfalls, and even though tired, he never stopped to take a breath. There was still quite a long way to go, so there was no time to dally about. The skull necklace that grounded Fox with powers dangled around his neck. However, still a novice in magic, Fox only had a limited grasp of how to control the enchanted necklace. Fox had learned a few fire spells and some other small tricks that proved to be helpful, but still had seasons of magical training ahead of him. Owl had told him that the use of magic had no bounds, and he was only limited by the skill, knowledge, and the expertise of the user. Fox had wished he had learned more. Just then, the skull began to glow, and Fox stopped running to look down to see the jaw of the mouse skull move as a sound came out. It was the voice of Owl channeling the skull as a vessel to deliver his message to Fox. Apprentice, listen. I'm following Wolf into the Banished Zone, where he plans to interrogate Crow so he can learn the location of the seeds. Keep heading towards the waterfalls. 
I will keep you updated when I find out more. Do not stop and stay silent, for there are many badgers about. Fox nodded at the necklace and obeyed, and continued along, energized by the message from his master. It had been a long time since Fox had been to the waterfalls. There were so many, and Fox had no idea which one held the seeds. No one did but Crow. Fox ran through the moonlit forest as Coyote was flying towards the valley below, expertly piding the mechanized bipedal battlecraft that he had no intentions of crashing this time around. Examining the trajectory and maps, Coyote began scanning for life forms on the ground below. Using heat sensors, sonar, and powerful optics, Coyote could identify a small creature, even at high altitudes. Don't worry, Fox. I'll find you, and wait till the badgers get a look at the firepower this baby packs, thought Coyote. The SMUV had several missile launchers, a laser beam, Gatling-style pulse weapons, and not to mention advanced ballistic armor plating. The SMUV stood 15 badgers high and weighed hundreds of times more. The coyotes were masters of technology and weaponry, developed and honed after many wars with bobcats and other nemesis that coyotes had acquired throughout history. The SMUV was one of the most formidable tools of weaponry the coyotes had developed. It was apt for space travel, mobile ground assaults, and had proved to be an invaluable tool in the field. More dangerous than that was the pilot, a true veteran and one of the best officers the CSF had seen. With this machine, Coyote was a true force. The SMUV's sensors began to chirp, and a monotone robotic voice emanated from the loudspeaker system. Life form detected traveling due east at a nominal speed. Bioscience show the animal is a fox with minor injuries and is surrounded by an unknown energy. That's Fox. Computer, lock onto that biosign and triple speed. Coyote let out a howl as the SMUV blasted towards Fox running below. Deeper in the banner zone, Owl closely watched Wolf from high above the night sky. Owl noticed that the banner zone, which was once a lush green grove, had become a wasteland filled with rows of dead blackberry bushes as far as the eye could see. It seemed Wolf tried to recreate the legendary blackberry bush and had failed many times. The blackberry bush has consumed you, Wolf, thought Owl. He was amazed at the obsession that still drove Wolf's conquest for power over the valley and the creatures in it. Owl then wondered what the valley would have been like if the blackberry bush had never been planted. Finally, Wolf and the other badgers arrived at a gray hillside that had a cave entrance popping out halfway up. The entrance was surrounded by the skulls of many different creatures animals that perhaps were caught on the wrong side of the boundary, who had become victims of the many badgers that patrolled the fields of dead blackberry bushes. It was the entrance to Wolf's den, and dark magic surrounded it. Wolf entered the den with Crow while several of the badgers stayed on guard outside, while the rest followed their master inside, where the interrogation of Crow was to begin. Owl flew in closer and landed in a nearby tree. He had to figure out a way into the cave to stop the interrogation and save Crow. The entrance now had five brutal-looking badgers standing guard. They didn't seem suspicious of being followed, seemingly not aware of the owl shaman hidden in the darkness watching them from a nearby tree. There was a dense abundance of dry shrubbery scattered around the entrance of the den. Instead of attacking the badgers head-on and blowing his cover, Owl decided that creating a distraction to preoccupy the guards would suffice. Owl's eyes held a faint glow as he muttered some incantations, creating a small ember of fire amidst a particular thick and dry section of the dead shrubbery near the entrance of the den. It took several moments before the smoke began to rise, and a small flame grew into a fast-burning blaze that stole the attention of the badgers on guard at the entrance of the den. Quickly, we must stamp that fire out! It could spread to the whole camp, yelled a badger. The guards all rushed over to the ever-growing fire. They would surely be punished if it were to spread, for Wolf was known for doling out severe punishments for the slightest of reasons. The fire distraction worked flawlessly, and while the den entrance was left temporarily unguarded, Owl glided inside undetected. The badgers furiously stamped out the fire, singeing their paws and fur as they yelped in pain. Owl could see lights and shadows at the end of the short tunnel that led to the main chamber of Wolf's Den. The murmur and shuffling of badgers could be heard, as Owl slowly walked further inside. The interrogation of Crow came into view. Owl stayed low to remain hidden in the shadows. 
Crow was laid out on a rock mound as his wings were being pulled in opposite directions by two badgers on either side of him. Wolf had Crow under several spells in order to get him to disclose the location of the blackberry seeds, as he angrily barked questions at his prisoner. Crow was writhing in pain and squawking nonsense, as he often did. The seeds, Crow, growled Wolf. As the badgers pulled his wings further apart, Owl winced at the sight of his old friend being tortured. But there were so many badgers, and Wolf seemed more powerful than Owl had remembered. Crow had long since lost his mind, and even under spells and torture could not muster any sense but squawk about acorns. Owl began to feel uncomfortably warm, for several bright fires inside the den illuminated the whole chamber, also effectively raising the temperature to uncomfortable levels. Wolf then abruptly ceased the interrogation and ordered the badgers holding Crow to let go of his wings. Crow lay upon the rock and did not change position, twitching in pain. Crow's eyes rolled back into his head, and letting out a final claw, he died. Owl clenched his talons as he felt even warmer from the increasing temperature of the den. Crow had died, and no one knew the location of the seeds, but to Owl's astonishment, Wolf did not seem to care. Instead, Wolf muttered something under his breath, after which a huge flash lit up the entire den, and Owl was blinded. The once dark spot he hid in was completely visible, and all the badgers in the den looked in alarm as they could now see Owl in full view, staggering in blindness. Owl tried to turn around and fly out of the den, but a vine burst through the side of the wall and wrapped around Owl's feet, promptly flipping him upside down. Wolf's magic had grown stronger over the seasons, and the aura that surrounded Wolf's den had made Owl forget his own magic spells. Blinded and upside down, Owl hooted in alarm at the entrance of the den. Greetings, Owl, said Wolf. As if it were an arm, the vine that held Owl by the feet tossed him to the ground in front of Wolf. Owl landed with a thud and rolled several times in the dusty floor of the den. It's rude to impose in one's den uninvited, Owl, but on the contrary, I am happy you arrived for you to see. I was hoping you'd come to witness your friend die. That was the plan, Wolf said with a menacing grin. Wolf began to circle Owl like a predator about to pounce on his prey. Owl coughed and slowly regained his vision as badgers snickering from outside filled the den to watch. I found the seeds already, while spying on your side of the valley many seasons ago. In fact, I've had many harvests of my own. This is no longer about blackberries, Owl. It's about revenge. I used crow as bait to lure you here so I could begin my takeover of the valley. I needed time to perfect my magic and raise my badger army once again. Now, with Crow dead, you and I are the only creatures that actually saw the original blackberry bush in its full glory. But soon there will be just one, said Wolf. Wolf looked to a blackberry that lay next to Crow's lifeless body. It was darker than a normal berry, so dark that it looked of pure black. It was one of Wolf's own creation. It was a poisonous blackberry, and it had enough potency to kill a thousand animals. You're the only one who could have stopped me. But with the power of the blackberries I've kept to myself all this time, I am more powerful than ever, and you've become too old and weak to stop me. I lured you to my den so you could witness Crow's demise before your own eyes, and with the spells I cast upon the walls of my den nullifying your magic and rendering you useless, it will be easy to kill you as well, snarled Wolf. Two badgers then grabbed Owl by the wings as a third badger grabbed the poison blackberry in its paw and headed towards Owl. Owl was weak from the cursed magic emanating from the walls of the den. Owl had underestimated Wolf's strength and could not fight back. The badger came closer with the poison blackberry, and the two holding Owl's wings began to pull in opposite directions. Owl let out a painful screech, and the blackberry was smashed into his mouth. The poisonous juice slid down Owl's stomach, and it began to burn. The poison worked quickly as the badgers dropped him to the floor with a thud and backed away from the dying bird. Now, foaming at the mouth, Owl's eyes rolled in the back of his head. Wolf looked upon his old rival and bore his fangs with a large grin, turning away as he headed towards the exit of the den. Wolf motioned for his badger guards to follow, and soon Owl lay dying alone on the floor of Wolf's den. He could only feel pain and was blinded by poison. Knowing this was the end of his long life, Owl sent one last message to Fox, again channeling the mouse skull amulet around his apprentice's neck. 
Fox was still running towards the waterfalls as the mouse skull around his necks began to glow again. Fox halted and listened as his master's final message was delivered by the skull of a long dead mouse. Fox, Wolf has the seeds. Forget searching the waterfalls. Wolf has killed Crow and I myself am dying of poison. It's up to you to stop him. I had so much more to teach you about magic, but you have to go to the banner zone and set it ablaze now. Go and set fire to his world. Maybe that will give you some time to rally an army of your own so you could fight him. Go now, for time is short. Owl was not one to lie or joke around. He always spoke the truth, especially when channeling through the mouse skull. Fox looked at the talking skull in shock and began to fight back tears as he began to run full speed away from the waterfalls and towards the banished zone where Wolf had murdered his teacher and friend. How could this happen? How could Wolf trick Owl so? Owl was the smartest creature in the valley. I will avenge you, Owl. Curse Wolf and his army, barked Fox. While Fox now ran towards Wolf and his army across the other side of the valley, the temperature in Wolf's den had lowered to near freezing, and Owl's body lay cold not far from his old friend Crow. The two had lived for countless seasons and died together on the same day, both murdered by Wolf's cruel desire for power. Chapter 9 Coyote noticed on the radar screen that the small heat signature of Fox was now headed in the opposite direction of the waterfalls. Is that Fox? Maybe it's another creature. Computer, activate the telescopic camera to identify the heat signature, commanded Coyote. The onboard computer complied, and an enhanced vision of Fox running full speed came up on one of the several screens positioned around the cockpit of the SMUV. Coyote stared in puzzlement as Fox had reversed directions. Coyote hit the max thrusters and burst even quicker towards Fox. It was surely not sanctioned that he borrowed this vessel, but he would have to deal with the higher-ups later. Coyote would be able to catch up with Fox in no time at this speed. Now that he had a functioning vessel, travel across the valley was easy. What's wrong with you, Fox? Have you become lost in your own forest? Coyote questioned aloud. Fox was furiously running towards the banish zone, cursing and becoming more winded with rage at the thought of Owl being dead. He then noticed blinking lights in the sky flying above him. A craft appeared, similar to the ship Coyote had crashed in the valley. Fox stopped and watched as the vessel came into full view as it sped in closer, finally stopping right above him. A large spotlight illuminated Fox in the forest floor below and he began to float upwards towards the craft in the glow of the spotlight. He squirmed a bit, not used to the sensation of being abducted, and soon Fox found himself inside the cockpit of some of the most advanced technology the coyotes had created. A furry creature sat in the pilot's seat and looked back at him. It was Coyote. Sorry to abduct you, buddy, but you seem to be lost, Coyote said with a grin. Fox stared wide-eyed at all the instruments and panels. He had never been on a spacecraft before. It was much more impressive technology than his old pack, although Fox wasted no time being impressed by the advanced spacecraft. Owl is dead and the seeds aren't at the waterfalls. Wolf has had the seeds for a long time already, and we have to stop him before he takes over the entire valley, said Fox. Coyote got out of the cockpit and walked up to Fox standing in the small cabin area inside the vessel, as the SMUV stood still hovering above the trees. Fox, are you sure? I thought Owl could handle himself with Wolf. Isn't he a powerful shaman? Coyote asked. Yes, I am sure. Owl told me with his dying breath channeled through the mouse skull, and I could sense his magic fade. Owl is dead, and we must stop Wolf on our own. My abilities cannot compare, so we have to set fire to the banish zone and rally as many animals together that we can to fight. It's our only chance to defeat Wolf and his army, answered Fox. Coyote looked to the instrument panel, then out the pilot's window towards a full, bright moon. He did not doubt Fox, and he had no plans on giving up on his new friend. Coyote headed back towards the pilot's seat and adjusted his cat, and hit multiple switches on the instrument panel and looked to Fox. All right, let's do this. Where are we headed? asked Coyote. The banner zone. It's about a half a day's run by paw, Fox motioned with his nose. Not in this, baby, said Coyote. As he activated the main thrusters, the sudden burst of speed knocked Fox to the ground. 
The SMUV threw through the night sky at a tremendous speed, and Fox couldn't help but be amazed at Coyote's flying machine. Magic was amazing to witness, but this was unlike anything he'd ever seen. As Coyote set coordinates in the navigation controls, Fox realized there was no way he could have made this journey running, even at full speed. He surely would have collapsed of exhaustion or discovered by badgers well before he could have reached the Banisone. As they flew above the trees in Coyote's ship, Fox could see the whole valley end to end. It seemed much smaller than Fox had always thought. Sure enough, upon the moonlit horizon, the Banish Zone was coming quickly into view. They flew just inside the edge of the Banish Zone, which was full of dead blackberry bushes and dark moving masses as Wolf's Badger Army flooded the earth below. Multiple heat signatures detected, chirped the onboard computer's voice through a speaker mounted above the radar screen, which showed large blobs of heat covering the entire ground below. Coyote again activated the telescopic camera and sure enough, packs of badgers were everywhere. They appear to be mobilizing. They must be planning an attack on the valley, said Coyote. Wolf's army is massive. If only Al were here to help us, said Fox. Don't worry, the SMUV was built for one reason. Not only is it capable of flight and space travel, its main function is to kick ass. Computer, our missiles, said Coyote. The onboard computer complied, and multiple rocket launchers popped out of the SMUV, aimed and ready to fly. Coyote slammed his paw on the big red button that read, Fire, and a dozen high-powered missiles fired towards the ground below into the masses of badgers. Large explosions from the missile impact sent badgers flying in all directions. Fox's eyes lit up from the bursts of light that were carpeting the ground below. Computer, another barrage, howled Coyote. The SMUV unleashed another deadly barrage of missiles upon the badger forces. Only a lucky few were able to escape into the surrounding forest. Coyote hit the thrusters again and they were off, deeper into the forbidden zone, picking off dozens of badgers with a high-power laser and gatling pulse weapon that was mounted on the SMUV. Fox was astonished. He would have never been able to do this alone, and would have for sure been killed. Maybe, with Coyote and his flying war machine on his side, they could defeat Wolf once and for all. Wolf looked to the sky and watched as the SMUV flew well above his mobilizing army, sending bits of lights and fire towards his troops. The flying craft was creating explosions at a magnitude and precision that Wolf had never seen. He narrowed his eyes and barked orders to the several dozen badger guards that surrounded him atop the gray hill above his den, where Owl and Crow's dead bodies still lay cold. Hundreds of small fires had started and smoke bellowed into the sky as the banished zone began to burn. This machine had laid out more destruction than Wolf could ever imagined. In fact, he was slightly envious. That envy turned to fear as the craft seemed to be headed straight toward him and his remaining guards at an impressive speed. Before Wolf could bark the order to retreat, before Wolf could bark the order to retreat, several lasers blinked out of the craft, striking the badgers around him. The badgers dropped dead instantly as the rest began to run. Wolf sat unmoved, but it had become obvious that his takeover of the valley would not be realized. The craft was close now, and Wolf found himself alone atop his den, surrounded by the bodies of his once toughest guards. He began to slowly back away, but before he could turn around and run, the craft had landed in front of him. The craft hit the ground and seemed to grow legs, which it used to walk mechanically towards him. Wolf desperately summoned vines from the ground, attempting to entangle the machine. The vines wrapped around the metal legs, but to no avail. The machine was too powerful and heavy, and the entangling vines snapped away. Wolf tried a lightning strike spell, but the machine seemed to absorb it, and soon the SMUV towered over Wolf, blinking and whirring. A soulless death machine stared Wolf in the face, and for the first time in a thousand seasons, he was afraid. Wolf began to speak another incantation towards the machine, but his curse was interrupted by a small laser beam precisely aimed at his shoulder. The beam pierced through Wolf's shoulder and he howled in pain and fell to the ground, unable to focus. Steam hissed from the machine as a hatch opened and a set of steps popped out towards the ground. Fox slowly descended the steps, and the mouse skull around his neck was growing fiercely. Wolf had known that Owl had taken an apprentice, but thought nothing of it. There was no way such an inexperienced creature could ever defeat him and his magical prowess that he had honed and perfected. If it weren't for a certain lost coyote that fell from space and crash-landed in the valley, he would have been right. Wolf tried again to utter a magic spell in defense, but Fox did not stop his approach, as another small laser flew into Wolf's other shoulder, interrupting his curse. 
Wolf was now pinned to the ground in pain, and Fox was now at tail's length in front of him as the sun began to rise. Wolf glared at Fox and began barking in anger as the mouse skull began to glow fiercely. Fox focused his gaze and with a flash, Wolf burst into flames. The fire burned intensely bright for a few moments, then ceased, leaving only a pile of smoldering wolf bones. Coyote stepped out of the ship and the two headed into the den to retrieve the bodies of Owl and Crow. They dug two graves atop the gray hill above the den and quietly buried them as the morning sun shed its light upon the valley. They left the banish zone aboard the SMUV and quickly arrived at Owl's mossy tree that now belonged to Fox. They sat inside the tree and rested. They crunched a few magic bugs while sitting by a smokeless fire. So will you stay here in the valley? asked Fox. I can't. I have obligations to the CSF, and they really do need me. I'm one of the best pilots they've got. Plus, if I don't bring the SMUV back, the higher-ups will have my tail, answered Coyote. Fox nodded and crunched on a magic bug as he stared into the blaze. He would have to learn and practice magic alone now with no guidance from Owl, but he had time. Suddenly, a small thud followed by a cracking sound came from the floor next to the fire. Fox and Coyote looked to see that the necklace that held the mouse skull had snapped off of Fox's neck, and the skull had cracked on the ground. Among the bits of broken bone lay several seeds. Blackberry seeds, they said in unison. They ignored the mouse skull fragments and picked up the seeds. There were four of them that Owl had kept hidden. Fox was speechless with the realization that there were blackberry seeds around his neck the whole time. Hey, do you mind if I take two of these back up with me? We can grow these in our hydroponic labs up in space. The bioscientists would love to study these blackberries. Coyote asked. Of course, I will plant the other two here, and again all the animals of the forest can eat them together, like in the old days of legend, answered Fox. They sat in the tree for most of the day, not talking much, for Fox was particularly sad that Owl was dead, and soon it was time for Coyote to leave. Coyote had made a new friend on his grand adventure, but the valley was too small for him to stay for good. He promised that he would come back and visit, and welcomed Fox to join him back into space any time he wanted. However, Fox declined, for the valley was the only world he knew, and he liked it that way. The two said their goodbyes as Coyote boarded the SMUV. As the craft powered up, Coyote set the autopilot for the space hangar high above where he had borrowed it from. As the SMUV took to the sky, Coyote sat in the pilot chair and looked out the window to see Fox sitting on a branch of the mossy tree waving goodbye. And with a quick salute, Coyote blasted back off towards space. Fox could only think of one word as he gazed out towards Coyote's ship sailing across the sky towards the setting sun. Beautiful. The End Special thanks to Yakuna and the folks down at the Crooked Goat.